raft of those. But very interestingly, in Australia and New Zealand, they are the, uh, the two lines there, the dark one and the green line, the most significant issue that blocked their interest in uh, faith was science. And by the way, that came in a close second on the global scale, where issues to do with um, some of the terrible things that have been happening in churches um, in terms of child abuse that was mentioned earlier in, the si in our service this morning. But right up there is this issue of science. And what that means is uh, belief in evolution. So I think you'll agree with me that there's a big issue here and that we really do need to deal with it and to know how to give answers. You know, the Bible says that we are to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, uh, the reason for the hope that you have. And we're called upon to give that answer with gentleness and respect. So do we have answers today? Do you know how to address this problem? Now, it may not be a particular problem for you personally, but remember those statistics, at least half of this country find it a significant issue. So we need to be prepared. And our ministry is about helping people like you get prepared. And we have a number of resources that I'll tell you about towards the end of the session today that aid you in fulfilling this requirement in 1 Peter 3.15. Perhaps the most um, powerful of those is our creation magazine. I'll tell you more about it later on. But uh, we also have a, an amazing website. This is what the front page looks like. In the top right-hand corner there, there's a search window. And if you type keywords into that, it gives you access to around 12,000 different articles, items of interest that are all aimed at encouraging you in your faith. There's a new feature article every day on the front page and we encourage people to go to that and to discover faith-building, God-honouring material that help address this major challenge to the Christian faith. Now, one of the really good things about our website is that it has a great web address, very easy to remember, and it's uh, as simple as anything. If you want to know anything about creation, you just go to creation.com. That couldn't be easier, could it? So I want to speak this morning on this subject of knowing where the evidence leads. You know, often people tell us that you Christians believe things in spite of the evidence. And what they mean is you ignore all the scientific evidence that tells us that the Bible's wrong. And, you know, I was trained as an engineer, and I must admit I find the evidence, uh, issues of evidence, very important. I don't like believing things blindly. I, I don't find that easy to do. But if something is supported by evidence, then I find it much easier to place my confidence and faith in it. And so that's why I want to talk about this topic. And, and my prayer today is that you too will be strengthened in your faith as a result of what you hear this morning. I had the great privilege of working in the aerospace industry for some 30 or so years. I was involved in the design of all of Australia's national satellites. So the kind of science I was involved in is what you could call experimental or operational science. And you see, that's the kind of science which gives us all the amazing gadgets and things that we just take for granted these days. Things like communication satellites, mobile phones, computers, advances in medical research and treatments and so on. But importantly, experimental science is based on observable, repeatable experiments. And that's the kind of thing which gives us the amazing technological gadgets and things that we have today. But it's all based on observable experiments. But there's another kind of science we hear much about. And you could call that historical science. Now in historical science, the scientist looks at evidence in the present, like this gentleman looking at the fossil in a rock there. And uh, the scientist makes up a story about the past to explain what he's observing in the present. Now something interesting happens when a scientist makes up a story about the past. You see, 
and if you think about it, this is inevitable. He will engage his beliefs about the past as he interprets the evidence. So this gentleman looks at this fossil in the rock and he might think to himself, uh, I wonder where this little creature fits in the long, slow progression from that first primordial cell all the way up to complex organisms like you and me. I can imagine him asking, how many millions of years ago did this creature live? Now, imagine though that this gentleman is a Bible-believing Christian. When he looks at that fossil in the rock, he might think to himself, well, you know, this little fossil was likely laid down as a result of the actions of Noah's flood, which deposited pretty much the whole of the fossil record around the world today. Now, that's a very different interpretation of exactly the same data, isn't it? The difference is only to do with what we already believe about its origins. So let's just summarise that. Operational science is about the present, it's about observable and repeatable experiments. Do you know there is never a conflict between the Bible and operational science? But historical science is about the unobservable, unrepeatable past. And the scientist wasn't there. And it's only in this area that there is any conflict between science and the Bible. And no wonder. Remember what the evolutionary story assumes right at the bottom? It assumes there is no God. And it builds a whole explanatory edifice on that assumption. The Bible, of course, says there is a God and he's the creator of the universe. And as Bible-believing Christians, we need to build our understanding of the world on that foundation. So no wonder there is a conflict and it occurs only in the areas of historical science. So how do we find out the truth about our origins? You see, we need to have an eyewitness, someone who was there, of course, someone who knows everything, who loves us, who would not deceive us, and who has written down everything we need to know about our origins. And friends, we have exactly that in this book, the Bible. No, friends, the Bible is, in fact, God's history book, isn't it? It's uh, his eyewitness account of everything that he did right from the very beginning. So when we go into the Bible, we then discover the truth about our origins. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Is your faith supported by evidence? And I want to use two little images here today. The first one is of this young lady taking a tentative step, or his child, <laughs> into a, uh, a lake or a river. Now she can see the ground underneath the water and uh, so she knows she's not going to fall into a, some abyss or other. But nonetheless, it takes a little bit of faith, doesn't it? But all the evidence is supporting her faith that she can step into the water. Now, this image depicts a leap of faith. We just hope that this young man here actually had checked that the water was deep enough, there are no rocks around and so on. So here he is taking a leap believing something in spite of the evidence, or perhaps even in the absence of any evidence. So when we open up the history book of the Bible, we discover that there is a clear timeline recorded in it. You can see that right from the time of Adam in the top left-hand corner there, all the way through to Abraham across that top row, all of the fathers and sons in succession and their ages are all given. So we know that there is about 2,000 years between Adam and Abraham. Adam, of course, the Bible tells us, was made on the sixth day of creation. So Abraham is born about 2,000 years after the creation. And then from Abraham through to the time of King David, and then via the line of Mary and the line of Joseph, we go to the time of Jesus. And friends, that is also about 2,000 years. So on that chart that I've depicted there, we have approximately 4,000 years of elapsed time. And of course, Jesus lived 
about 2,000 years ago. So according to the Bible, and this is not my idea, here we are today about 6,000 years after the creation. Wow, isn't that extraordinary? In this day and age, for someone to say they believe the earth is only thousands of years old, most people would think that you're some kind of nut. I mean, after all, hasn't science proven that the universe and the earth is billions of years old? Well, what is the basis of the belief in the billions of years? Well, firstly, it starts with the assumption there's no God. But then a lot of the ages of rocks and fossils and so on is based on the results of radiometric dating. So let's just take a quick look at how radiometric dating works. You know, you can think of it a little like an hourglass. You have a parent element that decays at a certain rate and it produces what is called a daughter element. Now, if you can measure the ratio of the parent element to the daughter element in a sample, then you can calculate the age of your sample. But you have to remember there are a lot of assumptions that go behind that. And also remember that we were not there right at the beginning, nor have we observed our sample through the whole of its history, its life. So that process only works if we make some assumptions. And there's a whole bunch of those. Firstly, we don't know how much parent element was in the sample of rock or fossil or whatever it is. We don't know whether some has been added or subtracted. We don't know how much daughter element was in the sample or whether some has been added or subtracted. And we actually don't know for sure that the decay rates have been constant. You know, there are seven independent assumptions we have to make none of which we can actually test because we cannot go back into the past to observe the conditions. And all seven assumptions have to be made before we can arrive at an age for our sample. So let's have a look at how radiometric dating works with samples that have a known age. Now, you might be thinking, how do you get a known age for something like a rock? Well, a good way is to take a sample of basalt from the lava dome of an eruption, erupted volcano that had a known eruption date. You see, there's a clock that starts ticking there called the potassium argon clock. And argon is an inert gas, it'll bubble out of molten lava, but it gets trapped when it solidifies and becomes a basaltic rock. So if we look at some uh, samples of um, lava taken from, or basalt rather, taken from known eruption dates, and then use the potassium argon clock to check the ages, we should find that they match up. But this is what we get. Here at Mount St. Helens, which erupted in 1980, potassium argon dates were 350,000 to 2.8 million years taken from a variety of samples in the lava dome. Is another one at Kilauea in Hawaii. 200 years ago, the eruption took place approximately, but the rocks were dated anywhere up to 22 million years of age. And here from Hualalai in Hawaii, it erupted in this particular case, this particular lava flow, around 1800. And yet the rocks there were dated between 160 and 3. million and 3.3 billion years of age. So we have a problem, don't we? Because we get results from rocks of known age which don't stack up. So if we have a rock of known age and we get the wrong answer, why would we have confidence that the answers we get for rocks of unknown age are right? We really don't know at all. And why? Because we have no way of testing all those assumptions that I mentioned. You know, different dating methods should give about the same results for samples which must have about the same age. Here's an example. At a place called Crinham in Queensland, there was a mine. There, about 20 metres down, they came across a, a forest which had been buried by a lava flow. Now, the lava, the basalt, was dated using the potassium argon dating method 
and was found to be around 45 million years old. And yet the wood, some of it was still charred, it was still just wood, was uh, carbon dated at between 44 and 45,000 years of age. But these things must be about the same age. The timber of the forest is buried within the lava flow. So surely different dating methods would give you the same, approximately the same results, but that's not so. I like this particular quotation, if a carbon-14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. And if it's completely out of date, we just drop it. Now, friends, I'm not trying to make fun of scientists here because I am one. But what you are seeing here is how our belief systems work. You see, when the data doesn't stack up with what they believe it should be, then this is what people do. We, when we're all the same, you know, we do the same which is why it's so important we have to build our beliefs on the only rock solid foundation there is. And that of course is God's word, the history book of the universe. Well, there are some interesting examples that do show consistency, of course, with the Bible's record of history. You know, diamonds are believed to be billions of years old. And uh, I hear that there was a, a wedding last week so that's wonderful was it yesterday perhaps um so there's a, a young bride now well i guess she would have got the engagement ring before then wouldn't she so but diamonds are called uh, a, a girl's best friend aren't they but you know if they were as old as billions of years as is claimed then there would be no carbon 14 inside a diamond and the reason is that carbon 14 decays away very quickly in fact, in um, just uh, a matter of 60 to 80,000 years, there'd be almost nothing detectable. So clearly there could be no carbon-14 inside a diamond. So no one had bothered to test for it. It's quite an expensive measurement to make. Until some scientists submitted a sample, of, a range of samples of diamond, and fascinatingly, carbon-14 was found in every single one and in significant quantities, not just background or, or impurity kind of levels, indicating that the diamonds are actually only thousands of years old, not billions at all. We had an article in our creation magazine, we called it Diamonds, a creationist friend. And uh, in coal, for instance, another form of carbon, Carbon-14 is found routinely, although coal is supposedly tens to hundreds of millions of years old. There should be no carbon-14 in coal, but every single sample that has been tested so far has revealed the presence of carbon-14, indicating an age of only thousands of years. You know, sometimes people think that coal is the result of millions of years of processes, and they say this is... Um, you know, it's just one of the reasons people get so concerned about burning coal. They think it's a completely irreplaceable um, resource. But, you know, let's have a quick look here at the uh, Latrobe Valley. The coal measures there are about 700 metres thick. They actually contain partly decomposed vegetation, still in a vegetable state. And it's consistent with massive flooding. Now, there's a story about the formation of coal called the Swamp Theory. And the Swamp Theory says that coal was formed in swamps where vegetation, leaves, branches dropped down uh, into the swamp, slowly compacted over vast periods of time, and uh, finally gets compressed and becomes coal. But, you know, the Swamp Theory fails completely in Latrobe Valley because there is no soil under the they're cold at all, just pure clay and there is no roots. There are horizontal ash layers that run through the coal deposit. That speaks of volcanic eruptions. That's a very violent environment, not, not a, uh, a tranquil one by any means. And there are large pine trees distributed randomly throughout the uh, Latrobe Valley coal seams. Things like King Billy pines, which do not grow in, uh, in swamps. But, you know, you can actually produce coal under laboratory conditions in a relatively short time. The key ingredient is temperature. 
And with just modest temperatures of only 150 degrees, brown coal was produced in a matter of months. And at higher temperatures, around 400 degrees, you can produce high quality black coal. Um, and so it really is uh, not something that takes millions and millions of years at all. I like the words that uh, my colleague, Dr. Taz Walker, uh, used once to explain or express the value of coal. He said, if ever there was a geological phenomenon that should remind us of Noah's flood, it is coal. Coal points to a global catastrophe because huge quantities of vegetation have been uprooted, transported and buried by water under great volumes, volumes of sediment all over the world. Now, what could have done that? Is there any record in God's record of history, the Bible, that describes a global process involving massive destructive forces on a geological scale that could have produced coal? Well, of course there is, and we're talking about Noah's flood, aren't we? And so much of geology is defined by the actions of Noah's flood. There's another interesting one, the White Cliffs of Dover. Now, they're white because they consist of a diatomaceous material that's tiny little sea creatures, uh, their skeletons all packed together. This reveals enormous quantities uh, of deposition in a watery disaster. But you know, the white cliffs of over are eroding at the rate of about a meter every six years. They're supposedly 65 million years old, laid down in the Cretaceous period. So if that's been going on all that time, the coast would have receded 10,000 kilometers. Of course, that's ridiculous. No one is suggesting that. But the point I'm making here is that the processes we observe today are consistent with the biblical timescales of only thousands of years and not consistent with the idea of millions of years at all. You know, if we look around ourselves uh, in this world of ours, we see there are about seven and a half million people on the planet today. Do you know if you start with six people, Shem, Ham, Japheth and their wives, and let that population grow at the rate of just under half a percent for about four and a half thousand years, that's how long ago the flood was, do you know what you get? You get about seven and a half billion people. Isn't that amazing? The population of the world today is consistent with the Bible's record of history. But you know, it's not consistent with the evolutionary story, which would have it that mankind appeared on the earth, Homo sapiens, about 100,000 or perhaps 300,000 years ago. Now, if that was true, where are all the people, friends? You see, that half a percent growth rate is quite conservative. It's actually about a percent or even more today. But if we'd been around for 100,000 years or more, we should be shoulder to shoulder on every square metre of the planet's surface. But it's not like that, is it? You see, the Bible's record of history gives a much better basis for understanding why the population is what it is today. Now, if you want to know more about this issue of the age of the earth, and I recommend uh, this article to you, You'll find it on our website at uh, creation.com forward slash age. And it lists 101 ways we can place an upper limit on the age of the earth, all of which are completely inconsistent with the evolutionary story. So friends, I think it's actually a huge leap of faith to believe that the earth is billions of years old. And why? Because the observable evidence around us is actually consistent with the Bible's record of history. So it's only a tiny little step of faith to believe that the earth is just thousands and not billions of years old. Now, let's turn our attention to this discipline of geology because it was in the area of geology that the idea of the vast age of the earth first arose. So here is this amazing planet that we live upon extraordinary in the, the way it's been uh, designed to provide every aspect uh, of an environment suitable for life. You know, if you look closely at the layers and layers of rock that we see in geology, such as what we see revealed in the Grand Canyon, perhaps one of the most, uh, the iconic, I suppose, geological example, 
And we see all these layers of rock and the conventional story based on the assumption that there's no God and we have to rely on natural explanations for our origins. That um, conventional view has it that each layer was laid down by some kind of disaster or a flood and then another layer on top of that and then another and another and so on, building up all of those layers over vast periods of time. And then in the case of Grand Canyon, along has come the uh, Colorado River and it's carved out this massive canyon and it apparently did so um, in, over vast periods of time. So when you look at that, you think, wow, it's so obvious, isn't it? Large scale sedimentary rock deposits all laid down by water. It must have taken millions of years. But friends, let's take a closer look at these boundaries. Here are two, the Coconino sandstone, that's the lighter layer at the top, and the Hermit formation underneath. Now the boundary between those two is uh, very clearly and starkly defined and evident for hundreds of kilometres in Grand Canyon. Now the conventional view would have it that there's about 10 million years between the Hermit Formation and the Coconino Sandstone. But if that was true, you would expect to find evidence of elapsed time. Like for instance, you would expect to see evidence of, uh, of vegetation, tree roots, animal burrows, and certainly the next time it rained, there would have been some erosion taking place. But friends, throughout Grand Canyon, that contact shows no evidence of erosion anywhere. In fact, what it shows to, uh, for us is that those layers were most likely laid down rapidly, one after the other, with virtually no elapsed time between them at all. You know, that is consistent with what you'd expect to find as a result of a global catastrophic flood. But have we ever observed that to happen? Well, friends, we actually have. And Mount St. Helens in the state of Washington in the US erupted back in May 1980, and it caused significant geological change around the base of the mountain, including the formation of a structure called Little Grand Canyon. It's called that because it's about 1 40th the size of the real Grand Canyon in, in uh, Arizona. But can you see in the uh, walls of the canyon those layers of rock? And there's a little river flowing at the bottom. If you use that conventional, slow, gradual interpretation, then you would believe that that must have taken many, many years to form. But friends, none of that material was there before 1980. And about two years after the eruption in 1980, there was a massive mud flow through that area which carved out Little Grand Canyon in just one day. How do we know all those things? Well, we observed them. You see, observable science is what, or observations rather, is what science is all about. You know, the Bible tells us of a global catastrophic flood. The springs of the great deep burst forth, the floodgates of the heavens were opened. We read that the waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. Sometimes people say to me, you know, but maybe the flood was just a local flood and the uh, those ancient Jews saw this flood in the Mesopotamian River Valley and they wrote about it. But friends, look at the words. And remember, these are words that God inspired, so they are true. It says, all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. How could it possibly have been a local flood? Unless, of course, it was perhaps something like this. You can't cover all the mountains with a local flood, can you? That's clearly ridiculous. And then people say to me, well, where did all the water go after the flood? Well, it's interesting, with the aid of Google Earth, we can zoom back and look down over the Pacific Ocean. And there you can see on the left, a little part of Australia, and in the top right there, there's the west coast of the US. There's a lot of water out there, isn't there? Do you know if you could raise the ocean basins and lower the continents so that the earth was a perfect sphere, then the water of the oceans would cover the surface of the earth to a depth of nearly 3,000 meters. That's where all the water went. But everywhere we look around the world today, we see evidence 
of a watery global catastrophe. Here at a beach just south of Sydney where I live, you can see layers of coal interspersed with ash layers, more coal, more ash, more coal and so on. It speaks of a rapid watery disaster punctuated by volcanic eruptions. We also see examples of fossils that run through multiple layers. They're called polystrate fossils. And if each of those layers took thousands of years to form, the tree trunk would long since have, uh, have rotted away. I want to play a short video clip from one of our DVDs called Evolution's Achilles Heels. And uh, it's interesting to see some of the examples of rapid formation of mountain ranges. Have a listen. But there are some things about modern mountain belts that we see that don't seem to fit with this conventional view. Rock is brittle. It doesn't bend very easily. If you try and bend it, it breaks. Now, granted, on a big scale, you might be able to get some pretty big bends out of a large rock. But these bends are tight and close, and you can walk from one end of them to the other. This type of bend and folding without breaking brittle rock uh, means that maybe it wasn't brittle rock at the time of its formation. These might have been much softer materials. After all, they were laid down during Noah's flood. They'd been compacted down started off horizontal, but then as the tectonic movements occur, they shifted and folded them while they were probably still soft. So when we look at it this way, what we realize is that the really tall mountain chains, the Alps, the Rockies, the Himalayas, they didn't exist before the flood. The whole reason that they exist is because of the flood. Basically, when we look at the geology of the Earth, we find that present processes do not explain what we see. Rather, what we see points to catastrophic processes in the past. And when we think about what those could be, it fits exactly with the account in Genesis of Noah's flood, which destroyed the whole Earth. Wow. You see, friends, the evidence actually is not consistent with the idea that gradual processes slowly shape the major features of our planet. See, it's really a leap of faith to believe that. But what a tiny step of faith to believe that a global flood best describes the major geological features we see. So let me move on quickly just to talk about the origin of life. You know, for those who believe in the natural processes idea that caused this universe, those people have to believe that somehow inanimate chemicals became living cells. Here we have Professor Paul Davies, an Australian scientist, not a Christian, and uh, he says, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organized themselves into the first living cell. And he goes on and asks, how did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software? You see, the cells in our body are controlled by coded software written on the DNA. And uh, where did the information come from? How did the software of the cell come about through natural processes? But you know, if you were to take a single cell and enlarge it to be the size of a great city, like, like Sydney, say, what you would see is an astonishing array of complexity and bewildering technology. You would find factories producing component parts, communication systems, transport systems, and there is even a powerhouse, multiple powerhouses in the cell. There are these organelles called mitochondria. In them are these membranes called cristae, and embedded on those is an amazing machine called the ATP synthase enzyme. Now, you don't have to remember all this. I just want to uh, touch on this briefly to give you some feel for the staggering complexity and brilliance of design inside even a single cell. Now, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and this little machine has um, been discovered to actually work like a, an outboard motor, um, owing to some amazing advances in operational science in observational 
imaging technology. And I want to play you a short clip that shows you how the ATP synthase enzyme works. And remember, if the cell was the size of the city of Sydney, one of these little machines would be about the size of my laptop. This animated sequence shows the ATP synthase enzyme in operation. The animation is based on an incredible series of scientific discoveries. Only the colors show artistic license. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency of the cell. ATP is produced by a tiny molecular rotary motor, rotating it up to 7,000 RPM. It's the first form that 100,000 will fit side by side in a millimeter. A current of protons drives the motor, unlike man-made electric motors, which use electrons. This portion of the enzyme is where a genesis diphosphate is combined with a phosphate ion in the presence of a catalyst to produce ATP, which is then released to make way for the next cycle. A copy of the enzyme shows the sequential operation. Almost every biochemical process in your body requires ATP. Such a nano machine exhibits all the characteristics of super intelligent design. ATP is vital for life, and many of these motors were needed before the first living cell could exist. An evolutionary impossibility. Now just imagine there are thousands of those little machines in every cell in your body. And uh, how did the first cell come about? One of those little machines, uh, at least one, in fact many, had to form by accident, along with a whole bunch of other biological bits and pieces, and then all assemble themselves into the first cell. In fact, Professor Sir Fred Hoyle summed it up very well. The probability of the formation of just one of the many proteins on which life depends is comparable to that of the solar system packed full of blind people randomly shuffling Rubik's cubes and all arriving at the solution at the same time. I mean, can you, can you imagine what that would look like? I mean, it's bizarre for anyone to imagine for a moment that a living cell could come about by chance. You know, it was back in the middle 1800s that Louis Pasteur formulated the law of biogenesis, which says that life only originates from life. You see, in observational science, we never ever see inanimate objects producing a living organism. So, friends, it actually is a massive leap of faith to believe that life arose through time and chance alone. But what a tiny little step of faith to believe that life was created. Remember what we started out with, that scripture Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but to do it with gentleness and respect. Friends, there is so much evidence that supports the truth of the scripture. And in fact, the evolutionary story um, is really bereft of evidence. All the observable evidence in the world around us can be interpreted through the lens of belief in the Bible as God's word. And we find when we do, it supports our faith and encourages us to know that the Bible truly is God's word. So how do we give an answer? Because it seems as though there is so much opposition and so much complexity around it all. Well, we can't all have the answers. No one does. But I want you to know today, friends, that there are answers to the challenges that science makes to the Bible, to the Christian faith. And I want you to know where to go to find them. Now, normally when CMI would come to a church, we would turn up with some books and materials for you to look at and to get equipped with. Of course, we can't do that. But what we can do for you today is to make available to you resources that will be sent to you post free. So here's how to get equipped. And there's a link there called an event resources link. And you can see it there. It's tinyurl.com forward slash, and then these eight letters, Y-B-Z-H-M-N-H-K. 
it's a good idea to write those down because if you use that link, you can go in and purchase materials. And if you do, they will all be sent to you post free. Now, of course, you can always go to the website as it is, but if you do that, then you have to pay for postage. So we're trying to make it for you as much as like we are physically present with our books and materials. So there it is again, just make a quick note of that. I'll bring it up again towards the end. And this is a great way. And now that link is only available to you until midnight tomorrow night. So make sure you make a note of it, go onto that link and you'll get all your materials post free. Now friends, we have a number of, uh, of great things that you can get a hold of. Uh, the email, uh, a newsletter service called Infobytes. It's a free email. Uh, it'll tell you about local events that are happening in your area. It always links you to encouraging articles on the website. Uh, if you sign up for Infobytes for the first time, the very first email you get will give you access to a free video download. And also our Creation 101 course, which is a great way to get up to, uh, to speed with the uh, issues surrounding the uh, creation evolution uh, issue. Now, if you follow that tiny URL link I gave you before, you'll come to a page which looks like this. And uh, there's the, the uh, DVD re uh, recording that you will get for free. That's a, bit, a download that you will get. Uh, creatures do change, but it's not evolution. And there's a spot there where you can indicate, make your selection if you want to subscribe or whether you already subscribe or whether you don't wish to. And what you need to do is scroll down and there you'll see a section that talks about our creation magazine that I mentioned at the beginning. Now the creation magazine is an absolutely marvelous resource. And I say that because it's written for lay people, comes out four times a year. You don't have to be a scientist to understand it. And uh, it's a marvelous resource to answer your own questions importantly to answer the questions that your children or your grandchildren might have and uh, you and it's a great witnessing tool as well uh, we have four adult children all of whom uh, are going on with the lord much to our great delight and pleasure of course that's not just due to my wife and i we know that's by the grace of god but we did bring them up on a pretty solid diet of creation magazine and they were given answers to their questions as they grew up. It is so important to do that. You know, using Creation Magazine, you can give it away to other people, and that's a great way to uh, be able to share your faith. This uh, person rang us up and he said, you guys make evangelism easy. I just give a Creation Magazine to somebody, and uh, the next time I see them, we talk about it. So it kind of gives a, a lovely ice breaking way of uh, getting around to gospel centered conversations. Now I want to uh, just ask if uh, any of you here um, actually already subscribe to Creation Magazine or to the Infobytes. And so I'm going to launch a poll in uh, just a moment. And if you're able to uh, just to take a moment to um, go on to your device and uh, answer the two questions there. The first one is, do you subscribe to Infobytes? That's our free email newsletter service. And the second question there is, uh, do you subscribe to Creation Magazine? So if you wouldn't mind just uh, filling those things out quickly and uh, we're getting some results flowing in, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for that. I can see we've got, um, yeah, but still coming in. That's good. So if you just got a moment to complete that, that's really helpful for us because it gives us uh, just a good idea of, uh, of where we're at. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's excellent. I'll end the poll. And uh, in fact, I'll share those results. So Everybody can see them. I think it comes up there. There it is on your screens. So 50-50 on Infobytes and 30% of you already subscribe to Creation Magazine. So that's marvelous to see. Well, let me, um, let me tell you how you can, a little bit more about the magazine. I think I mentioned it comes out four times a year. You can subscribe for one or three years. 
And you know, if you have an email address, you will also get a digital version of the subscription. And uh, that digital version is great. It's accessible on up to five different devices. And uh, you, that's a fabulous way, by the way, parents to give access to your children to a magazine a subscription or parent, grandparents to your grandchildren. You know, for every subscription that we receive via that tiny URL link, you will receive a free back issue. So you've got something to give away uh, and to share with others immediately. Now, if you are already a subscriber, then friends, I want to encourage you to renew your subscription because that will extend it. We'll just simply put your uh, new subscription on the end of the current one, and that will give you access uh, to that free magazine. So scroll down there, make your selection of one or three years for the magazine subscription. Uh, there's a question there, is this an, a renewal? Just answer that and uh, then scroll down again and that will give you access to a section called recommended titles and there are three things there the first is the creation answers book that consists of 20 short chapters that address the most asked questions that christians and non-christians alike have and uh, then there's the creation intro pack so you can get an answers book and this little book refuting evolution which by the way has sold over half a million copies. It's the largest selling uh, creation book of all time. And along with that DVD, uh, A Brief But True History of Time. I think when I was with you last year, A Brief But True History of Time was the talk I gave then. But that is priced at two thirds of the normal recommended retail. So if you purchase an intro pack, it's like buying two of those things and getting the third one free. And also the Genesis Academy. It's a 12 DVD set that uh, is a detailed uh, scientific and theological uh, and devotional study or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Commentary. That's the word on the first 11 chapters of Genesis. There's also a free downloadable study guide on our website. So once you've made your selections there, just click and that'll proceed you through to the general and technical titles. Scroll down through those and then proceed on to the DVDs. We have uh, quite a range of DVDs available. And then onto children's titles. I notice uh, we have quite a few children with us this morning, which is exciting to see. Um, and then finally into the little booklet section. That uh, one on the second row there in the middle um, the Creation Survival Guide, How to Graduate with Your Faith Intact. Very important for students, high school and university students. I recommend that to you. So if you click again, that'll take you to the final page where you need to fill out your details. There's an opportunity there for you to make a donation to our ministry. So here once again is that tiny URL link if you didn't get a chance to write it down before. tinyurl.com forward slash YBZHM for Mary N for Nelly HK. And of course, you can always go to the website, but if you go to creation.com, you'll need to pay postage uh, on whatever you purchase. So friends, let me just wrap this up um, very quickly. The big picture is like this. There was an original perfect creation in which there was no death, suffering, disease, or sin. Then came through man's sin, the intrusion of death, disease and suffering. And friends, that is the world that we live in today. The Bible says there is coming a future heaven and earth, a new heavens and a new earth. Now, if we allow belief in the millions of years of evolution into our thinking, it's like actually taking that top left hand corner out of the picture. So what we are left with now is that God must have made the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering and disease. But you know, it's actually worse than that because the new heavens and the new earth, the Bible says, are going to be a restoration. A restoration to what? More suffering and death for millions of years? So there's really no hope for the future either. So I hope you can see how belief in evolution actually undercuts the very gospel message itself. 
we need to put that top left hand corner back into place by believing the Genesis account of history in God's history book, the Bible. Because that also gives us a basis for belief in our future hope with him. So friends, when we proclaim Jesus to this lost and dying world, we need to remember that we are talking, number one, about the creator of the whole entire universe who came to this earth to become our perfect sinless sacrifice. He paid the price for our sins, a price that we could not possibly pay. But then he rose from the dead, defeating death and declaring himself to be the son of God. And, you know, that gives us a hope for the future because every single believer, too, will be raised with a resurrection body. You know, friends, the Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God right now, interceding for each and every one of us. And he's the bridegroom seated at that wedding feast to which we have all been invited. So I want to thank you very, very much for uh, listening this morning and for for, uh, for following along with me. But I do want to encourage you to go where the evidence leads. Because you know what? That is towards the truth of the Bible. So we can believe it with our brains intact as well as our hearts fully devoted to our Lord and Saviour. So friends, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, let me hand back now to uh, Dave to close the service. Bless you all.